Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Hyman Scott from the University of California, San Francisco. And he's uh, coming to us today and he's going to be speaking about the latest in HIV prevention strategies. And a lot of the things that we've talked about today in some ways touch on HIV prevention strategies because there's now more and more overlap between developing new agents for treatment and new agents for prevention. So Dr. Scott, thank you. appreciate the opportunity to talk about HIV prevention. Um, and so I'm going to focus mostly on PrEP. Um, and um, I have no financial disclosures in the last two years. Um, so these are some of the learning objectives for this discussion is to really describe and talk about the efficacy of each of the PrEP options, um, how to initiate, monitor, and discontinue safely injectable cabotegravir. Um, and then discuss some of the management options for um, individuals who are on PrEP who have discrepant HIV test results. Uh, and I'll actually touch a little bit on of the implementation of PEP, or post-exposure prophylaxis, in the setting of long-acting PrEP, because it does uh, create some uh, interesting complications. So uh, the first ARS question um, is a 31-year-old cisgender MSM who's in a serodifferent relationship with a a uh, person living with HIV for the last two years. His partner is only occasionally viral suppressed, um, and your patient is interested in PrEP. Um, he has outside sexual partners who he refers to as guest stars, um, and reports that he uses meth almost daily. Um, he says that he's got okay adherence to his medication for depression and is taking it about one to two days per week. So what would you offer? Uh, daily oral TDF or TAP, on-demand TDF FTC, or injectable? To get up to 50, we'll go ahead and move forward. So, um, so the majority of individuals uh, would offer CAB LA, and I think that's the right answer. I think one of the things that we want to talk about is what is somebody's preference for um, for prep agents and options, and I'm going to spend some time talking about that. But CAB LA, given that they've demonstrated challenges with daily pill adherence, um, offering a daily pill is probably not the best way to go. So um, the CDC 2021 update um, sort of changed this PrEP guidance. So I think, um, and this sort of is very, I think, uh, applicable to doxy-PEP discussions, is that we started out focusing on those who are high risk for PrEP, and we're paying for it now because a lot of people think it's just for people at high risk, and many folks don't think they're at high risk because you always know someone who's doing something more often than you are. Um, and so um, we're now backing back into this PrEP for all perspective, and that was in the 2021 update. Um, and really it is, um, the different regimens are sort of based on populations and some medical uh, contraindications. So daily oral prep on the left with TDF-FTC uh, really is for um, all populations except those who might have pre-existing renal disease or some rare uh, intolerance. And then daily oral TAF-FTC has sort of a more narrow, most importantly for individuals who are having receptive vaginal sex. So it both excludes trans men and cisgender women. Um, and then 211 or on demand TDF FTC, which you heard a little bit about in Ypergay, um, is limited to cis men. We do offer it to trans women um, who have primarily receptive or insertive anal sex with their partners. And the CAB LA, which is sort of for all population except for people who inject drugs. And so that's really a gap we have in our um, use of uh, prep options for that group. And daily or prep, as a reminder, works really well. This is with data from TDF from AVAC. Um, and you can see that if you take it, it works really well. I like to point out the Carolina blue or maybe the UCLA blue <laughs> at the bottom, uh, which is a voice trial, which really showed uh, negative uh, efficacy. So there are more HIV infections in those who had received uh, TDF FTC driven um, almost exclusively by difficulties in adherence and the qualitative data that showed why the women in the study weren't taking it and the social context in which they are existing, uh, making daily oral medications for prevention 
uh, difficult and problematic. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how that impacts our discussions about choice for our uh, populations we wanna reach. So um, this is some data that was presented at CROI by uh, Dr. Marazzo from uh, UAB. And I think this really started to change our perspective on what our counseling messages are for cisgender women around uh, oral TDF-FTC. So these are pooled data from demonstration projects and it looked at these longitudinal patterns of adherence um, and they use this group-based trajectory which I sort of understood but essentially it summarizes that there are individuals who sort of uh, go into four buckets. So consistent daily users, uh, consistently high but not daily users, and then those who start out high but decline over time and those who are consistently low. And so it sort of matches more with what we think about in the forgiveness of TDF-FTC for MSM in the sense that taking four tablets a week is associated with high levels of protection in that group. And so these are the uh, numbers that were associated with individuals who sort of met, were sort of put into these buckets. And when they looked at what the incidence was, it was overall pretty low because the incidence among cisgender women in these populations, in these locations was low. But you did see this trend where even those who had consistently high but not daily adherence still had very high protection um, uh, from HIV. And so really starting to think about some of our messages over at Persistent to Women that you have to take it daily might not actually be accurate and that we might be able to be a little bit more soft, I think, in the way that we talk about um, adherence requirements for daily oral prep and might change some of the um, ways that it's received by cisgender women. So uh, going on to Cab LA, so um, in the HPT and 083 and 084 data, which showed uh, superiority, um, and always a reminder that these, uh, the 083 study was designed to be non-inferior uh, study and actually showed superiority, which was a surprising finding being 66% better than TDF-FTC. And 084, given our understanding of problems with daily adherence with TDF-FTC, um, showed an even higher efficacy. So this is not compared to placebo, of course, it's compared to TDF-FTC. Um, and then we presented some data, um, updated data from HPT and 083 that looked at the population where we have the highest incidence in the United States, black men and sex with men and transgender women. Um, and we saw that among those who were on TDF-FTC in a clinical trial with all the support, including free medications, HIV incidence was still 2.11 per 100 person years, which is quite high in the TDF-FTC arm. It was 0.58 in the cab LA arm with a very, um, with a positive uh, hazard ratio of 0.28. So 72% reduction in HIV acquisitions among the population where we have the highest incidence in the United States. We saw um, no infections in the cab LA arm in non-white, sorry, non-black MSM and transgender women. Um, there are five infections in the TDF-FTC arm. But I think it really speaks to the need for uh, equitable implementation of this intervention to address the ongoing and persistent and expanding disparities that we have among PrEP in the United States with black men and sex with men and transgender women. Um, and this tool really has a, a real key way to play in addressing that um, if we can um, implement it with all the, the challenges with cost and access. So as you've seen, our uh, PrEP menu is expanding and it's been exciting to see as we've gone from TDF-FTC alone to um, the current options. And then these are some of the other ones that are in uh, clinical trials. As we heard, as Flatrevir is, um, is uh, as a PrEP agent, is sort of off the, um, off the board and there's, they're going back to the drawing board for that agent. But we have other options, um, including lenacapavir, which is in a phase three study purpose studies, which is being evaluated among uh, MSM, cisgender women, and trans individuals. So we'll hopefully have data on that in the next couple of years um, as an option. Um, but we've, we know we've had some lessons that we learned from oral prep that I think we have to not forget as we think about these new options. Um, and that overall, this has been extremely inequitable um, implementation and uptake has been uh, quite poor. So our goals for ending the epidemic is 50% uptake. We are not meeting that overall and we are exceeding it for some populations and way below uh, for many others. And this is some data that we looked at in our primary care clinics in San Francisco, and we saw that even if people start PrEP, who stops it uh, is actually inequitable as well. So we see higher discontinued rates among our black patients compared with other patients in our clinic. So really a lot of work to do to uh, help people stay on PrEP. And I think a lot of this has to do with our systems, and our systems make it really hard. Um, so Thinking about PrEP awareness among staff, this is an interesting table that looked at 
what happens when you are implementing prep versus when you're just thinking about prep. So when you actually implement, you find all these problems that you didn't think you had. One of them was lack of prep awareness among staff. And the example that I use in our clinics is really, you know, even if the provider is very prep forward and prep supportive, the patients are interacting with lots of other staff, including front desk staff. And we've had clinics where they've told patients we don't do prep here, even though the providers offer it. And this is in San Francisco. Um, and so this is uh, a key element across, I think, clinical sites. Um, and then thinking about staff capacity, particularly with injectable prep, um, and then the financial concerns. Uh, providers in general are pretty poor at understanding what the financial impacts of PrEP are. I have a lot of uh, rapid, so we do rapid initiations of uh, ART, of patients who got, went to the pharmacy, were told they had an $1,800 copay, said I don't have that money, so didn't start PrEP, and then subsequently serial converted within three months. So we have a lot of challenges that we need to work through. Um, and people are interested in these other options, so we want to make sure that they're available. So these are some data from uh, a study in Australia that looked at um, PrEP experience MSM. So these were individuals who were not new to PrEP. And um, the majority of those who had actually been on oral PrEP were actually interested in something else. They were interested in long-acting injectable. Um, this is true in the US, even though the long-acting interest was a little bit lower at 25%. Um, if you look at those who reported condomless anal sex in the last six months, the non-daily options were actually more um, uh, there was more higher interest among the, those populations. So I think targeting and supporting individuals based on what their primary interests are um, will be really important as we roll this out. Um, this is true for cisgender women. This is a study from HBTN086 that showed that long-acting injectable PrEP options are uh, quite desirable among these populations and that you know daily pill, <laughs> pills are like really poor. So like should we be surprised that individuals aren't taking something that they don't want? Um, and this is a study that was presented last year at CROI um, from MTN, the Microbicide Trials Network, which is unfortunately no more as a trial network. But they randomized individuals um, to receiving a ring, and then after the open label ex extension continued at the end, they said, well, you have the choice to take an oral prep or you can continue on the um, vaginal ring. And the individuals who chose the oral prep actually had quite high adherence um, and so really giving people a choice and letting and supporting their choice um, has been associated with high adherence. So it's really something that I think we have a lot of data in our contraception um, as well, that when you offer choice, you get an increase of five to 8% uptake of interventions, but also have a potential for increasing um, adherence among those populations as well. So the way that I sort of think about uh, these different options as we um, expand our menu is sort of what are the pros and cons? And these are really the things that I talk about with my patients as we talk about what are the options that um, are available for them. So I, I do group TDF and FTC, um, TDF, FTC, and TAF, FTC together um, for daily. Um, and then they're um, really talking about, you know, for TDF, FTC, you do have daily and on-demand options and it's something that people can go back and fourth, too, it's, uh, it's a quite flexibly um, uh, regimens to implement in clinics. You don't have to have people come in for clinical visits. Um, I also am the medical director of a sexual health clinic in San Francisco. We have about 3,000 people who are on PrEP, and we use express uh, clinic visits, so they don't actually see a provider. They just come in, get their labs, get their refills, and, and then they go about their lives. And so you have that option with oral regimens um, and that you have a quite expansive coverage for populations, there's quite uh, strand, standard and straightforward testing, um, and TDF-FTC is so cheap, so with 340B pricing, um, it's on the order of $4 a bottle um, for the generic, so, it's, uh, so our clinic actually just purchases it and gives it to people if they're having trouble um, accessing it. Um, but you know, it, it does require daily adherence or this complex 211 where people don't know like how to time their sex with their pills. and. We have to create these complicated graphics to try to explain it, and they're still confused. Um, and so, um, and then you also have the issues with pills and not those not being acceptable. And then for Cab LA, you know, it's superior to TDF FTC in efficacy trials, but then we have to remember that efficacy is not the major um, important thing for a lot of our patients, um, but it is something that um, doesn't require daily adherence, um, is quite uh, discreet. So you go in for your visits, you get your injection, and you don't have to take a pill. 
Um, and then it does require a lot more visits. It does require more complex testing. Um, and then we really don't understand how people are failing or why people are failing, um, and despite receiving on time injections. The other aspect, I think, with Cab LA, which I like to highlight, is that um, there was subgroup analyses in the um, HPTN 083, and the list of the um, lower incidence groups are all the groups that we've been focused on for our HIV prevention efforts. So for young people, for men of sex with men, um, and for uh, black participants uh, in the U.S., like it was really a, um, there was no, the, the HIV um, effic incidence efficacy was actually higher or uh, similar among those subpopulations, which I think is a really important key um, for us to implement it. So um, I want to go through some of the clinical and other considerations for cab -LA, um, as I think that's the one that we're feeling the most pain um, in implementing uh, in our clinical settings. So for HIV testing, um, there is a viral load test requirement at, at every visit. Not all clinics have access to that. I think those that are doing HIV care, it's a more integrated and in support, but for those who are um, either in primary care or um, who are sending it out for prevention, it's sometimes a, a barrier. Um, and then the visit structure, so um, having additional staff, lab, um, and injection visits. Um, and then we try to do same-day starts, but it's really challenging to do that in the absence of rapid testing. Um, so having rapid testing would be a requirement, but then there's all the CLIA and laboratory requirements that go along with that. And then how you manage missed or delayed injections, I think, is a challenge. Um, and do you cover with oral cab or do you cover with TDFFTC? And then what do you do with, um, with PEP if somebody has uh, a missed or delayed injection? Coverage has uh, been a, a nightmare, to be frank, in California. So um, we have, in California, expanded a lot of our PrEP outside of medical settings. Um, and so because you go through as an insurance um, benefit, you can go through pharmacies. But if it's a medical benefit, it has to be in network. And so all of our 3,000 patients we have at our sexual health clinic are out of network. And most insurance companies give a $9,000 out-of-pocket cost um, for coverage, and this medication is about $3,700. So most of our 25-year-old patients don't have, you know, $4,000 for their first dose of uh, cavitator. Um, there are some insurance programs and assistance programs um, that are helping offset the costs, um, and it's something that I think we've been pushing for on a policy and advocacy side to expand so that we can get coverage of this, because it has become a huge barrier for our patients being able to access uh, CabLA. Um, the FDA label for cabotegravir, so it's a um, loading dose at zero in four weeks and then subsequent injections. Um, if you look at the uh, package insert, this is how they sort of describe covering a missed visit. Um, and so uh, if someone, they, they sort of just make this what I think is a somewhat arbitrary distinction between planned and unplanned missed visits, but if it's less than four weeks and it's planned, then you give an alternative uh, like cab or I would say TDF-FTC would be acceptable. Um, and if it's unplanned, then it's really this sort of soft assessment of whether or not it's safe, and then administer it um, you know, if it's less than uh, four weeks. And then if it's four weeks late, then you just reload them. So the way that we approach this is, is quite different. It doesn't really matter if it's planned or unplanned. If it's late, it's late. Um, but it's not late until you're um, at four, if you're four weeks or more. Um, and so in HPTN 083, actually, we spent, it was at eight weeks. So I think some of the questions that come up is, you know, when do you need to reload? So to follow the label, it's uh, if it's at three months or more, then you reload. Um, but in the trial, it was actually at eight weeks past the target date. Um, so um, for planned or unplanned, if it's, less, if it's less than four weeks, you just offer them TDF-FTC. So all my patients have a starter pack of TDF-FTC to take if they need it, if they miss their injection. Um, and if they're more than a month late, then we just reload them as soon as we can. But we, they also have TDF-FTC. Uh, um, and they also tell them to start that if they have an exposure um, as part of PEP before they come in for testing and to get a three-drug PEP regimen. Um, just a reminder about the cabotegravir uh, tail. I think we were really worried about this in the trials. Um, and we're concerned about um, this long uh, sort of pharmacological tail where the, the medication watches, washes out over a long time. So we see this difference by uh, gender, uh, sex assigned at birth. So individuals who are male uh, sex assigned at birth, the uh, median duration was about 10 months. 
Um, but you can see the interquartile range is up to 35 months. So this can last quite a long time and is even longer for individuals who are assigned male at birth, going up to 52, um, uh, going up to 52 months. That's not weeks. So it's 52 months after their last injection. Um, it can last. So the concern was whether or not people would develop resistance. Um, we actually didn't see that um, because uh, we saw infections that um, occurred despite on-time injections, and that's where the risk for um, for resistance occurred. Um, but this can last quite a long time uh, in the in the blood. And so, how we talk to people about this if they decide that Cab LA doesn't work for them, injection site reactions are pretty common. So we tell everyone, you know, they're going to happen. Those should get better, um, but some people decide that they don't want to continue it. So what we generally do is we recommend starting oral regimen um, either daily or on demand after their last injection. Um, and CDC guidelines actually recommend quarterly RNA testing for a year after discontinuation. Um, and so really it is a commitment to be able to offer RNA testing um, for individuals for quite a while after their last injection. And one of the uh, key things that's come up, there's actually been at Croy, there was a poster that actually reported in the community setting um, um, a breakthrough infection that occurred despite on-time injections. Um, and so going back to the data in HPT and OA3, um, that um, you saw quite a uh, long delay. So with standard HIV testing algorithms, it was about uh, three months for incident cases. So if you someone acquired HIV, you're gonna delay uh, diagnosis by about three months. Um, and that using RNA testing it to identify um, individuals, one will help identify them, um, their HIV status, but also prevent uh, development of major NCD um, resistance associated mutations. Um, and so that's really the rationale for integrating RNA testing. Um, and then just using the most sensitive RNA test available is really what we recommend, although I will say that if um, RNA testing is the only limitation to implementing cab LA. We are recommending and supporting that that not be a barrier um, to, to offering it and that understanding that there might be a risk of this, but that the risk of HIV infections, I think, outweighs the risk of um, this delayed um, diagnosis if that is really the major or the only barrier. Another um, syndrome that was de described at Croy this year is sort of this um, acute HIV, um, this long-acting, uh, sorry, long-acting early viral inhibition or Levi syndrome, which is distinguished from acute HIV in some quite uh, distinctive ways. So the setting of these HIV infections that occurred in the setting of long-acting really are more of a smoldering instead of an explosive, a high viremic uh, level um, infection. These are sort of uh, very difficult that there's serial reversion that occurs um, and that the tests can be discrepant um, in between um, blood draws and that it really is quite difficult to, to diagnose um, and that, um, that it can take months instead of weeks to make a diagnosis um, and, uh, and that you know, this is something that we're going to see not only with long-acting cabotegravir but potentially with the other long-acting agents um, as, we're, as they're coming into the, um, into the market. And so this is something that we, I think, from a diagnostic standpoint, are going to need to continue to work on uh, to develop uh, strategies to diagnosis, both point of care or laboratory-based uh, testing to identify um, these infections before um, three months or six months afterwards, uh, depending on how long they last. All right, so we're going to uh, move on to another ARS question. So this is a 35-year-old MSM, uh, also in a zero different relationship, who wants PrEP. Um, he says his partner is unsuppressed and is starting a new regimen because uh, he said that he has some antiretroviral resistance. I mean, he's pretty sure his partner mentioned something called M184V. Um, he, doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't like using condoms, um, so that's not an option. So uh, what would you recommend? Well, despite not wanting to use condoms, you say you use condoms anyway until your partner's probably suppressed for at least six months, then U equals U. Um, or you prescribe TDF-FTC or TAF-FTC uh, prescribed three drug PEP, or would you do something else? So we'll go ahead and get started. 
All right. So, um, so almost half would prescribe uh, TDF-FTC or TAF-FTC. Um, about a third would uh, be concerned enough to, to want to do PEP. Um, and so this really gets at the question of, um, do we think that MRE for a V in a uh, known, uh, in a partner, change your efficacy uh, that you would estimate for these um, PrEP regimens? Um, so uh, PrEP th breakthroughs are quite rare. Um, with TDF-FTC, unlike cab LA with high adherence, we really didn't see these types of breakthroughs. Um, and when they did occur, they were case reportable, which is why there are some cases that are in the literature. So this is a, a summary of those cases um, that occurred despite high adherence, which is either measured by DBS or HAIR. Um, and you can see that M1E4V was a common uh, resistance mutation in almost all of these uh, case reports. Um, and so again, this is a still very rare because these are case reports out of the you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals who are on, um, on TDF-FTC or TAF-FTC. Um, but it is something that sort of talk about with our patients um, and make a, um, uh, you know, a shared decision making about using this. I think cab LA, if it's an option, would be something to discuss. And then the other piece is that, particularly if someone has outside partners, um, you know, this might not be the, um, you know, the place where they might have the most risk anyway. Um, and so I would agree, I would offer TDF FTC and TAF FTC, um, or TAF FTC um, being less concerned about uh, M1E4V itself um, and CAB LA if, uh, if we had an implementation option for that. All right, so, um, so this is another uh, ARS question. So it's a 31-year-old patient um, who on prep comes in for his routine quarterly lab tests. Um, his fourth generation antibody test comes back positive, but the confirmatory test and viral load are negative. What would you do? Would you repeat the test but continue prep as you assume that's a false positive? Would you repeat the test and stop prep but start ART for acute HIV infection? Repeat the test and stop prep until you can determine what the infection status is or something else. So we'll go ahead. So, um, all right, okay, great. So we don't have a consensus. So 40% uh, would repeat the test and, um, and start ART for acute HIV. Uh, about a third would assume it's a false positive and about a third um, would just stop PrEP um, to determine what the infection status is. Okay, so just a reminder, um, this is the FEBIC stages that occur after um, HIV acquisition um, and that you have sort of sequential uh, antibody responses, but the viral load um, should be detectable quite early on in infection in the setting of um, sort of in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. But of course, PrEP makes it more complicated. So there are a couple of options if you see the discordant or ambiguous tests. Um, really what you wanna focus on is repeating the serologic or RNA tests um, DNA tests are not something that we uh, do. We sometimes do those as part of research projects. Um, and then what we try to do is use a test from a different manufacturer. Um, and then you have to figure out what you're gonna do with the antiretroviral drugs. So if you uh, continue PrEP, if they're adherent, um, you have the ability to maintain protection, but you do have the risk of resistance if somebody does has acquired HIV um, in that time period. You could stop PrEP so that you can do your testing but you might actually put someone at risk for acquiring HIV because they're no longer uh, protected. Um, and if you started ART, whether or not it was for treatment or for um, uh, if they weren't adherent to PrEP, for example, I think the drug-related AEs is less of an uh, issue because we have such tolerable medications now, allows you to potentially confirm the diagnosis, um, but you might actually not be able to um, know whether or not over time, for example, if they zero revert like we've seen with some of the cab LA cases. Um, so it really is um, this quite challenging um, uh, on the, and just as a reminder, there is a PEP line, so there's a CDC PEP line. Um, I actually got a text, an email last night about a case of PEP in the setting of cab LA and um, sort of how do you interpret these tests. Um, so this is a great resource. There's a, um, 
they're available during the day, but they will send you emails at night because I got it at like 10 p.m. last night. Um, and so they will get back to you um, about these questions. So um, you have support if, if things come up that you have uh, questions about, and I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you, Hyman. Uh, very nice. And also, anybody has questions, please come up to the um, microphone. So some of the audience questions. Have there been demonstration projects, or is there another approach to trying to make PrEP more available through primary care clinics, you know, particularly outside the major cities? I mean, how, right now we've sort of got these specialized clinics that are doing this. Is there an, would it be better to have a more generalist approach? You know, I, uh, I, your mic, your your lapel one might oh, still be on. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, so I, I think that there has been this desire to integrate it into um, to primary care. Um, I, I think that there might be a shift, a, a different paradigm shift around that. I think for two reasons. Um, one, uh, Kaiser, which does uh, you know spend a lot of effort uh, optimizing primary care, does not do that. They don't actually have this primary care programs, they have it within their um, prep program, and so they centralize it. Um, and then we have this massive um, sort of experience with contraception, right? Like we don't, we have opportun opportunities and options for people to receive that outside of their primary care settings because there are all these layers of, you know, how do you talk about sex and how do you talk about it in a way that is, you know, sex positive and comfortable and not like awkward. Um, and so I think that that is a, a level that not all providers are comfortable with. Um, and so I think um, the people who really are interested in doing PrEP sort of, uh, I think, start to do that um, in their practices. And I think the patients know who those people are um, because they hear about it from their friends. Um, so I think we should definitely make access to the training and support like very widely available and not force people to go into places where they're going to be traumatized um, by something that might be said by the clinic, um, that might be said by the provider. Um, and that we really need to take this sort of client or patient-centered approach towards ensuring access that's um, truly equitable. And then a semi-follow-up question to that would be then, if, if we're really trying to make it equitable for people that live in the large areas of the U.S. where there's poor access to healthcare in general, mm -hmm. let alone PrEP, how do we ensure that we have some intervention for them to reduce the incidence rate? And, or will we never achieve our goals to reduce the incidence of HIV, of HIV in the United States? What, short of a vaccine? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, these, these PrEP agents, particularly these long-acting agents, I mean, we have efficacy numbers that are, you know, we couldn't have dreamed of. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you have a highly effective intervention. You know, I, I think this is a policy question. Ryan, like, we know that Ryan White outcomes are better in places where Ryan White is, is, mm -hmm. um, is being implemented. So I think we need a similar structure to support PrEP implementation. And, and that is in the populations that we see um, disparities in all other types of ways, but actually HIV outcomes are better in our Ryan White system. And so I think that's the model um, that we should really be leveraging. Um, prevention is different, um, of course, because individuals have different motivations for prevention. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that from a policy standpoint, that that's probably going to be the way forward. Okay, thank you. Next question. When you're monitoring somebody on Cab LA, what viral assay would be the most sensitive for detecting latent infection or emerging infection? Would you use a standard quantitative assay or a qualitative assay? What's recommended? Yeah, so the, um, so the qualitative RNA assays are the only FDA approved um, assays for um, diagnostics for um, for HIV infection. Um, so I would say I would use the one that's available. So what we're actually using in San Francisco is a pooled RNA. So we have a, a collaboration within the health department where our, our clinics send um, you know, uh, samples to the clinic and then we pool them with a one to 10 pool. And then if the pool turns positive, then we um, sort of test into the samples. And so it's a cost saving way. It's already what we're doing for identifying acute HIV in our community, but it also alleviates some of the cost and burden of 
doing that testing. So I think that's going to have a viral load threshold of about 400 instead of 40. Um, but I think from the balance of implementation versus <laughs> sensitivity, that it's a win for the clinics. And I might be mistaken because maybe I'm not up on everything, but that's a type of program that's only legally permissible within a healthcare department setting, right? You, you couldn't find a clinical lab that would be CLIA certified to provide, or not CLIA, but you know. Um, yeah, so um, I, uh, so you actually can. So uh -huh. if you have, it's a lab-based um, um, uh, test. And so labs can actually develop their own in-house tests um, for those types of reasons. I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for either large health systems um, or health departments to support the implementation mm -hmm. in the clinical sites. Um, particularly to get it to places where, you know, courier services are a challenge if it mm -hmm. has to be frozen. Um, so there's a lot of logistical challenges that come along with this that I think the, um, the policies and the systems we need to sort of adapt to support. Okay. Hey, hey Jeff, could I follow up on that? Is that okay? Yeah. So, so I mean, that's really interesting because that seems to, I, I mean, I think this whole kind of craze about Levi doing HIV RNA tests is, is really a, a diversion and something that needs to... Um, <laughs> Uh, is a barrier to implementing long-acting PrEP. And by having a threshold of 400, you're, you're saving money and, and stuff, but you're actually gonna miss what the CDC uh, is, wants us to look for, which I think is fine, but yeah. why do it at all? Oh, why do the viral load testing at all? Yeah, why, why, why do it at all? Because if when the viral load gets above 400, you're, you're much more likely just to have a positive answer. I mean, not necessarily in the setting of long-acting um, agents. So if you look at the seroconversion cases in OA3, you know, there was uh, individuals who sort of had a viral load and it came down again and they had subsequent seroreversion. So I, but, I do but think But how many were uh, above 400? Uh, there were at least two that were above 400. I, I, I hear your point and I agree with you that, like, it shouldn't be, um, like, that shouldn't be a reason not to do this. It shouldn't be a reason not to implement it. Um, there are actually data that using this sort of strategy is better for identifying acute HIV as well. Oh, no, we, we and, invented it. Yeah. yeah. Chris, Chris Pilcher invented it. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh. so I, I think that, you know, I think that the idea that we are in COVID, we've seen this with COVID, like that we're using this serologic testing when we have a, you know, we have a molecular test to identify the actual organism that we're interested in. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is going to push us towards more viral load testing. And I think some of these resources to support it are going to need to adapt so that we can actually do this. Because this is going to be true for, you know, and if we get a vaccine and it use causes neutralizing antibodies, then no one's going to be able to do a viral uh, right, antibody right. testing. Right, right. Yeah, but yeah, point of care, uh, viral load testing. I mean, the issue with point of care is you can't really get down to 20 or whatever the, you know, the qualitative test gets to. But yeah. people probably can get to 400, which is what you're doing anyway. So, yeah, and I think um, we're going to have to be... Um, judicious in what we decide is, a, is acceptable. Um, and I think that, you know, doing a qualitative test that has a threshold of 20, if you can't implement it anywhere, is not useful. Right, exactly. Right, it's the classic thing where the, the best is the enemy of the good, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. We need to roll out PrEP wider, yeah. and yet if we go down this pathway of really low viral load monitoring, then we'll never get it done, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So another question about, you know, if you have a cisgendered woman who's got decreased renal function who wants to be on PrEP but doesn't have access to CAB, should you just not give that person TAP FTC because the data doesn't support it? Or do you assume that it was all because of adherence and this person's going to actually take it? Um, well, I think that TAP FTC challenge was not adherence. It was the fact that the decision was made to proceed with clinical trials that did not include cisgender women. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I use the shared decision making. We have given TAF FTC to cisgender women, um, and you know we do provide gut counseling about what you know that we're doing this without data. Um, there are some PK data that suggests that it should work, but you know we don't have clinical data that they'll be highly protected. Um, and then they you know they'll have the choice to make a, if they're willing to accept that risk um, and make a decision about whether or not they want. Right, and I, I think that probably people in the audience are already doing that to some extent, but it's good to hear some, somebody uh, assuage our concerns about you know, practicing beyond the data. Thank you. Yeah, we go off label all the time. And I think you addressed this, but just to clarify, so a person who's discontinuing CAB, how long should they stay on oral 
prep, if, if all they're interested in is covering the tail, if, you're not, if they're not going to continue something for oral prep anyway? Well, I wouldn't continue anything if they're just concerned about the tail. I mean, I'm concerned about them getting HIV. Uh -huh. And so I think, um, you know, if someone has ongoing exposure, um, then, you know, uh, if, uh, you know, they should be, the tail will last for quite a while, but it really is, um, you know, making sure that individuals are covered for prevention as well. Okay. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Hyman, and thank you, everybody.